very good morning everyone let's uh, get started with the introduction to docker as the first topic for today so we'll have this session uh, starting at 10 a.m till 1 p.m in between we will have a couple of short breaks to ensure uh, everybody is fresh and uh, we are good to learn a new concept So in this section, I'm going to talk about the overview of compute service. We get into the discussion of how containerization is different from the virtualization. We will understand what Docker is. We get into the discussion of the various Docker terminologies and different editions that we have available for Docker. We'll also understand what are the Linux core components which is making the Docker. Whenever you think of uh, deploying an application or a service, you have uh, many different uh, infrastructure as an options. Mostly the bare metal infrastructure, the virtualized infrastructure, and the containerized infrastructure. So every of, every one of this option uh, has its own advantages and disadvantages. Let's understand and take a look at those advantages and disadvantages. The bare metal server is nothing but the physical server, which is a single tenant physical server. We mostly don't prefer having multiple applications running on the same physical server uh, as it is meant for a single tenant. So the disadvantages of working with the bare metal server is one app, one server, which is going to be an expensive solution. And not all the time we may get the expected configuration. There is high possibility of uh, mismatch of the capacity. It is possible that the configuration of the bare metal server may be more than what we want or less than what we may need. So this high possibility of mismatch of the capacity and of course expensive maintenance uh, taking care of the keeping those bare metal servers the maintaining the temperature for them a lot of maintenance expenses involved. So there is the second option which is the virtualization. Virtualization is a technique of uh, virtualizing your underlying infrastructure such as memory CPU storage, right? So for the virtualization, you can use any type of infrastructure such as it can be the laptop, a data center, or can be a cloud instance. On top of which you can have a hypervisor running and the hypervisor will allow you to run multiple applications and each of those applications would need a guest operating system. And each of that guest operating system will be isolated from one another. Whatever is running on the uh, virtual machine one will not be visible or conflicting with the virtual machine two because they are isolated. So virtualization is a technique of virtualizing the underlying infrastructure. So each of the virtual machine would need a guest operating system which is running on top of the host operating system or directly on top of a hypervisor. So there are two types of hypervisors, the type one and the type two. If you have the type one hypervisor, you don't need the host operating system to be running. You can have the hypervisor directly sitting on top of the infrastructure. We'll come to that discussion in the next slide. So the virtualization allow you to run a different flavors of operating system running on a same infrastructure. And virtualization helps eliminate the need for you to have extra hardware resources for each of your application to run. Hypervisor basically is nothing but a software which is also known as a virtual machine monitor or VMM, which helps create and manage the lifecycle of the virtual machines. A hypervisor allow one host computer to support running multiple guest VMs by virtualizing the underlying infrastructure such as memory CPU and storage. There are two types of hypervisors, the type one, which directly runs on top of the hardware, the type two, which runs on top of the host operating system. Mostly 
for learning and training purposes, we use the type 2 hypervisor, such as VMA Workstation or Oracle Virtual Box. Mostly in production, we prefer using the type 1 hypervisors, such as KVM, Xen, Hyper-V, ESX, or ESXi. There are many more list of uh, type 1 hypervisors uh, available. Here is an diagram of how a type 1 and type 2 hypervisor might look like. The only difference you notice between the type 1 hypervisor and the type 2 hypervisor is for the type 1 hypervisor, you don't need the host operating system as the hypervisor directly running on the infrastructure or the hardware. Whereas type 2 hypervisor would need an operating system. In my case, I have the Windows 10 as an operating system. Right? And I have the VMware workstation software installed and I'm running tons of those virtual machines which are needed for my training purposes. Right? So mostly for the learning, training and testing purposes, we prefer uh, going with the type 2 hypervisor. Otherwise, in production, you mostly get to see a type 1 hypervisor, which will give you a good performance. There are a few disadvantages. Before I even start counting the disadvantages, Believe me, the virtualization is a technique or technology which has been used from decades and it will be continued to be used. There are so many uh, features that uh, uh, the virtualization provides to us. Some of the disadvantages that I'm listing out is to do with uh, are related to the containerization discussion. Otherwise, there are tons of those advantages which will still um, help us, you know, run our applications on the virtualized infrastructure. So with that, I also want to say containerization is not a solution for anything and everything. There are all there. You have to consider the use case and the purpose why you are looking for the containerization. Some of the disadvantages that we want to discuss is each guest operating system will have its own kernel, a dedicated kernel. Each VM will have its own kernel. It does not share the host system kernel like what containers do. And each of the guest VM will have its own set of libraries and dependencies. So since each VM includes an operating system and a virtual copy of a hardware, I mean, when you create a VM, you allocate the amount of CPU memory and storage that VM should consume. For example, I bring my VMware workstation software to you. If I want to create a VM, I'll have to say file, create a new virtual machine, choose the option between the typical or custom, and then you can decide whether you want to browse the operating system ISO image immediately or you want to browse it uh, later. Then choose which version of the operating system you want to install. I'm picking the Linux and then the version 8 as the Linux operating system name whatever you want to name it and specify the location where you want to have that vm to be stored on your host system allocate amount of uh, storage space that you want to provide to that vm even you can go ahead and customize the hardware such as if you want to increase the amount of memory or if you want to increase the amount of uh, virtual cpus basically while creating a vm you are allocating the resources and these resources are coming from the host system, right? And you can also browse if an ISO image or a physical DVD media available with you. So you can do that and you can pick and choose. You can add additional hardware device you want, or you can remove some of the hardware devices which you may not want, right? So this gives you complete flexibility for the training learning purposes, the type two hypervisor and almost what you what I just demonstrated that and more than that can be done on the type one hypervisors as well. So this is how we generally create a VM. I just created a VM, but it does not have an operating system loaded yet. I just uh, demonstrated how a VM can be created. So when you create a virtual machine for each of the virtual machine, you uh, provide the amount of memory, CPU and storage that you want to allocate. So VMs incur a lot of overhead beyond what they've been actually consumed. I mean, if your only purpose is to deploy a HTTPD web server and the VM is not only consuming the resources needed for that HTTPD web server service, it is 
consuming the resources even for other components of the operating system to be able to run. Whereas there is the containers which can only consume uh, the resources which is needed for that specific application to run because containers are just your application, the dependencies and the binaries and libraries that are needed for your application. Since each of the VM has its own dedicated operating system, there's also expected licensing cost. And patching, upgrading, taking care of the security of your server, doing the server hardening would require a larger team and a lot of time. The boot process of the VM is also longer as it is the complete operating system. So these are some of the disadvantages we want to uh, understand and were containerization going to address some of these uh, disadvantages? Now, what is containerization or what is container? Containers are containerization is a method of uh, operating system level virtualization. So, virtualization is a technique of virtualizing your underlying infrastructure such as memory, CPU, and storage. But containerization is not doing that. Instead, can each container will run as a process and will consume the resources from the operating system. So you're not doing uh, infrastructure level virtualization. Instead, you're doing an operating system level virtualization. You don't need to upfront uh, allocate the memory, CPU, and storage for your containers. But if you have a use case you want to, of course, that is doable. But the very fundamental difference between the virtualization and the containerization is what? In virtualization, we virtualize the underlying infrastructure, whereas in containerization, we are actually virtualizing the operating system because each of the container is running as a process above that operating system. In case of virtualization, you had the choice of type 1 and type 2 hypervisor. For type 1 hypervisor, you don't need the operating system as the hypervisor directly runs on the infrastructure, but you don't have the choice for the containerization. You must need an operating system, and the recommended operating system is any flavor of Linux with a specific kernel version. If you thinking of Docker as your container runtime uh, manager or tool, then minimum kernel version 3.10 should be there. Any flavor of Linux. Of course, you can run Docker on Windows as well, but you need to have some virtualization software and that can help you. I would request everybody to be staying on a mute. I will take up the questions at the end of the session. I hope everyone understand that. Thank you for your understanding. So containers allow you to run an application on all of its dependencies in a resource isolated processes. You don't need a guest operating system, but you used to have it for our need for the virtual machine. And because of the reason containers doesn't need a guest operating system, there's not much of resources uh, that a container would need. Containers share the relevant libraries and resources as they need, like a virtual machine. Virtual machines will have uh, dedicated libraries and binaries. They don't share anything from the host operating system. Whereas containers can share, our containers share the host operating system binaries and libraries. Containers are lightweight and they are faster than virtual machines as they are not the complete operating system. Of course, you can have a containers run on top of the virtual machine, meaning I can create a VM. And I can have a Docker install on that VM, just like. I'm connected to one of the remote system, which is a virtual machine. I have a Docker installed. So that is also doable. So you want to leverage the features that virtualization giving you, plus also take advantage of the containerization technology by having a Docker or containers running above the virtual machine. 
let's try to understand how a containerization is different from the virtualization. For either virtualization or containerization, you would need some infrastructure, which can be a laptop, a data center, or a cloud instance. Absolutely fine. But in virtualization, you have a choice of having the type 1 hypervisor, which can directly run on top of infrastructure, or you can have a type 2 hypervisor, which will run on top of the host operating system. And the hypervisor is what manages the lifecycle of the VM, meaning creating the VM, starting, stopping, allocating resources, all that is done by the hypervisor. In containerization, you would need the host operating system, which is recommended to be the Linux operating system, and you will have the Docker engine software running. It's just a package. When you install the Docker package, it will install all of the required dependencies to be Docker to be able to run. It You just can think like a Docker is like additional package on top of operating system. It is the Docker which manages the lifecycle of the container. So we understood two things, right? Let me bring you the notepad. So virtualization. In virtualization, we have the hypervisor, which manages the lifecycle of a VM. In containerization, we have the Docker, which is basically one of the container manager or container runtime interface which basically manages the life cycle of a container right so this is very important for somebody getting started with uh, what uh, containers are and what docker is most of the time people get confused with be between the container and the docker so Docker helps manage the lifecycle of a container. Let's understand more differences. Virtualization is a method of hardware level virtualization. Containerization is a method of operating system level virtualization. Each VM that you create in virtualization would need a dedicated operating system. But containers share the host operating system also the container images that you will need for a containers to be created vm is larger in size as it is the complete operating system containers are smaller in size when i say they are larger in size and smaller in size it can be related to an operating system that you would need or a container image that you would need. Let me just explain you. If you need to create a VM, you would need to download an ISO image. For example, if I think of creating a CentOS based VM, I need to give a Google search asking for what? Download CentOS. I pick up the latest version of this CentOS. I pick up one of the mirror. Unfortunately, the first mirror is not available. Let me go to a different mirror. As you can notice, it is about 8 GB. It might take about hours and minutes to download that ISO image. Of course, it's a one-time job. Once you have that ISO, then you can create many virtual machines out of it. As you can notice, it says two hours. It depends on the internet speed. For some of you, it may say just two minutes or 20 minutes, or some of you, it may say two, 20 hours, depends on the internet speed. But if I have to download the image that I would need for a container, I may go to Docker Hub. I need the container image for me to create a CentOS container. You'll see there is the container image available for CentOS. 
and there are different versions of the CentOS available. The 6, 7, the latest, which is 8. The way we download these container images is right now I don't have any container image, Docker image LS. Let me just go ahead and say Docker search for an image CentOS, which is what uh, we did it in the GUI as well. There are many different uh, images available. So let's just go ahead and pull one of the image. Docker image pull CentOS. If I did not mention the repository or registry from where to pull, the default registry is uh, Docker Hub and the default repository is the official repository. It's going to pull the first image. Again, it depends on the internet speed, how quickly it gets downloaded, but it should not take more than a minute as it is smaller in size. Let me now check for if there is any image. As you can see, the CentOS image is just about uh, 200 MB, but of course it is not the same image what we looked at for um, a VM. That is the complete operating system, but this is the very minimal version of the CentOS designed for containers to be created. Once after I have any, uh, I have the ISO image downloaded for the VM, I can create a VM which I did it already, and I can power on that VM, and I need to go through the process of the VM getting created, which would take about 30 minutes of time. It will take you to a couple of uh, screens where you have to make a choice of how you want that installation to be, such as the time zone, the partitioning, the packages, all of those choices. But I have a VM already up and running or created to save the time, which I will use it for the comparison and demonstration. What if I need to create a CentOS based container? Right now, I don't have any containers running, Docker container LS or LS space dash A. Of course, I'm going to demonstrate also how to install the Docker for the initial discussion and demonstration. I'm using the VM, which is already having the Docker installed. But it, today you will also learn how to install the Docker. So now let me go ahead and create a container, Docker container run with the name server01 dash dat for the detached interactive terminal. Use the image CentOS. Believe me, end of today's session, you'll all be very much comfortable with these commands what I'm typing. I'll make you comfortable if you're new to Docker. Now let's let's verify if that container is created. As you can see, the container named server01 is created. It is up in the status and we are good. So it just did not take even a minute, less than a minute time. If I need to create a VM, it would take about minimum of 20 minutes to 30 minutes of time. If I want to explain you one of the uh, discussion with, uh, what if you have a requirement of deploying 10 web servers? Maybe, HTTPD based web servers. You have been given two choices, either to pick the virtualization or to pick containerization for that requirement. Let's try to understand how they are different from one another. If it is a virtualization, first thing you need to do is download an ISO image. The size of the image may vary between 5 to 8 GB. Let me go with the size of 5 GB. And how much time you might have to spend. OK, to download. 
at bare minimum, we need to spend about 60 minutes of time. Is what I believe. Again, depends on the internet speed. And if let's compare with the containerization, you don't download the ISO image. Instead, you download and container image, which is about 200 MB. And how much time? Download. Just need a minute. Right. Now, how much time you'll have to spend to create a VM? Minimum averagely about 30 minutes into 10 VMs. You end up spending about five hours of time. Of course, there are ways how you can automate that VM creation. But I'm just going uh, with a manual process. Now, if you need to create a container, you just need one single minute or less than that. Into 10. You just need 10 minutes or less. Right. How much disk space do you need for each of the VM? Minimum averagely 10 GB for each VM. Into 10 VMs is close to 100 GB. How much space do you need for a container to be created? It just is exact size of the image, which is 200 MB into 10 containers is equal to 200 MB plus some bytes. Let me explain you what I mean by that. So each container that you create is a run instance of an image. Let me go ahead and create one more container named server 02 using the same image. And let me create server 03 as well. Now when I do Docker container LS, I have three containers in a running state. If I need to know how much of the disk space each of these containers has taken, I can use the option dash S to show the size. As you can notice, the containers are not even taken a zero byte, not even taken a byte. But they are all referring to a virtual storage, which is nothing but the image size. So creating multiple containers does not multiply the storage space. Of course, the same can be done in the virtualization as well. For example, if I need to create a VM, because I keep creating multiple VMs for my training purposes. So what I generally do is I create a template. If you can notice, I have a template. And I can right click on that, manage, make a clone. Choose the snapshot from where you want to make a clone and you get two choices, the linked clone and the full clone. When I say full clone, it's going to be the exact extra size of the storage space that you need for a new VM that you thinking of creating or cloning. It's just that the state of the current VM will get copied. You don't need to spend time following those set of instructions to create a VM, but you would need the exact storage space of whatever the parent disk. The link clone can be just a pointer to the parent disk. It doesn't need the exact, again, storage space. But there's a drawback with the link clone. If the parent disk is corrupt or deleted by mistake, 
you cannot access the VM that you create. But advantage is what? You get to save a lot of disk space. Our containers are kind of a linked clones. A container image is a storage or a disk or a parent disk. And each of the container that you create is a linked clone. So if I create a linked clone, I name it whatever I need uh, to the default. And if I power on that VM, all the changes that I make inside that clone will be separately maintained. And those changes what I'm making in this clone VM will only be visible to that VM is how a containerization also works. Each container that you're creating from that CentOS image will be a linked clone kind of a concept. And the changes that you make when you go inside the container, for example, if I say Docker container, I'm trying to get inside the container named server 01, for example. And I make a file, for example, I create a couple of files. Files I just created is only visible to what? Container server 01, not to container server 02 and 3, though they are created from the same parent our base image. And same is true for the virtualization as well. What I'm saying is what we are doing in a containerization is there in the virtualization as well. But here we need a template also to be created. And that template to be created, it will take longer time. And there are a few more disadvantages that we will understand very soon. So now disk space is what? It's just the same of the container image and some bytes, right? So the discussion that we started is we wanted to deploy 10 HTTPD based web servers, and this is the steps that you may have to do, but this has not got the HTTP server ready, up and ready for us. What is the next step? Now we have to install and configure HTTPD for each of the VM. So let's just go ahead and do that. If I go to one of my VM which is running, I need to say yum install dash y HTTPD. So I'm installing the HTTPD on the host operating system, meaning it's a virtual machine. Then I should say systemctl enable and start HTTPD. Now I can go to a web browser and access my web service. A two-step process. One, install the package, second, enable and start the service. That should give me the web server. There you go, a test page. And how about containers? There's already ready-made container images available for you to have the HTTPD based web server. If I search for HTTPD, there's already ready-made container images available. It is just a matter for you to say Docker container run by the name web01 dash dat and then the image that you want to use. Now I did not pull the image. As you can see, it says unable to find an image. So it's going to pull the image from where? From the Docker Hub. So you have two choices. Either you can have the image pulled in advance, running the command docker image pull, or you can let the docker container run process will pull the image if it is not locally present. When I say docker container ls, 
you get to see a new container named Web01 is up and running and listing on port number 80. If I run the command docker container inspect to know the IP address of the Web01, it basically gives you a lot of details of that container. I'm very much interested in getting the IP address of the container. I can just do a curl. There you go, it works. It's just that easy for you to have the HTTPD based web server up and running. The point I want you to understand is even in the VM also, we did the same actually. We said yum install HTTPD. You can compare that with the image getting pulled. And we created a container. You can compare that with starting a daemon or a service. But the pain that we have is getting to that step of installing a package, create, download the ISO image, create a VM, the storage space needed, the resources needed that you may not need because it's just not the HTTPD package currently here, right? There are many other packages there. If I do a RPM dash QC or QL actually, not QA to carry all of the packages. There are a lot of packages which are currently installed on this machine. If I take a word count of that, there are close to 1300 packages. Do we need those 1300 packages for my HTTPD to run? No, that's not true. So then why don't I have an operating system which will only have my application specific packages dependencies, binaries and libraries. Isn't it? Which is when we need to start looking at the option of a container. So container images will only have the application specific packages. In my case, the HTTPD image will only have HTTPD package. Nothing else. Of course, some more packages which may be some dependency. Otherwise, it's just the HTTPD package. Hope that gives you the understanding of what is or how different is uh, containerization from the virtualization. I'll continue my discussion. So each VM would need a dedicated kernel. Containers share the host system kernel. Each VM will have its own binaries and libraries, whereas containers share the binaries and libraries from the host system. In virtualization, if I need to have second web server, I need to go through that process all over again. Or I may have to clone it. But in container, no. Once the image is downloaded from the same image, you can create tens of hundreds of those containers and consuming no additional space unless you get inside the container and make some changes. Of course, there is some space for the container runtime, but not noticeable. Containers would take longer boot process because they are. They are more packages. If I just do a init six or reboot, it's going to take a longer time to boot. OK. So that's not true with the containers. They get created in seconds. Think of. Think of it, right? That is unnoticeable time, right? So VMs to be able to create, we need to spend a lot of time. The containers gets created in seconds. VMs consume more resources such as CPU, memory and storage and containers consume less of the resources. If you're planning to migrate your virtualized uh, uh, application or virtualized infrastructure applications or uh, the application that are running on a virtualized infrastructure is little challenging due to hardware incompatibility. You need to ensure uh, the source infrastructure and the destination infrastructure is compatible or matching. That's not true with the containerization as container containerization separates your application from the infrastructure because it is running at the operating system level. Developer would have to spend a lot of time setting up the environment if it is virtualized. 
and developers can just get started with containerization where the productivity of the developer will be increased. But then what is Docker then? So the simple definition of the Docker that I gave you is Docker helps manage the or Docker manages the lifecycle of the container. So Docker is a tool for you to manage the lifecycle of the container. Docker is an open source platform for developing, shipping and running your application. Docker enables you to separate your application from the infrastructure and run your application quickly and swiftly. Docker manages the lifecycle of a container. And the use of the container. Is for your deploying your application is what we call it as the containerization. So Docker is being developed in the year 2013 and it was developed as an internal project at one of the platform as a service company. Called dot cloud and later it's been renamed to Docker. I would request one of you to admit if somebody coming in the lobby. I don't want to switch between the screens. I hope you don't mind. So there are three terminologies in the Docker that you need to be clear with. The Docker file which contains all of the application dependencies defined. And the Docker image which is built using the Docker file. The Docker container is just the run instance of a container image. In our case, the Docker image, we pulled it from the Docker hub. Of course, you can build your own image using the Docker file. Let me just quickly explain you how you can build your own custom Docker image. So let me make a directory. And cd into that directory. And create a file by the name Docker file. The very first line in the Docker file should be from. What should be the base image? And what are the commands that you want to run? Such as you want to run the command m install dash y epel dash release. You are trying to install the epel repository. Epel stands for extra packages for enterprise Linux that will allow you to install additional packages such as nginx or the packages which are not there as part of the uh, standard operating system. And then you want to also ensure to run the command m install dash y update instead of instead of install I will say it is actually update yum update dash y and then you want to run the command yum install dash y nginx I'm trying to pick up the example of building the Docker image using a Docker file for nginx based web server once you have the nginx installed you may want to copy some files from the host system, such as you have a custom index.html that you want to copy under inside the container when it is being created to slash usr slash a slash nginx slash html. Then you may also want to expose your nginx based container on a port number 80, which is default anyways using TCP protocol. You want to run a couple of commands when the container is created using this image. That is to ensure the nginx daemon. Is running in the foreground. So these are some of the instructions that you want to have uh, 
when the container image is uh, built. OK. So. There are many other directives that we can use within the Docker file. These are some of the simple of directives that we can use to build a custom Docker image. I'm building my own custom NGNX based image. Otherwise, if I just go to Docker Hub. And I can search for an image called NGNX. I have already NGNX image available. The reason why you may want to build your own image is for a security reasons or maybe a custom requirement. Let me save this. And I would want to have an index.html file. So I'm going to print some message into that. Into index.html. Right now in my directory, I have two files. One is the Docker file, which contains the instructions of how an image to be built and the index.html, which is a dependency that I have defined inside the Docker file and the index.html going to be copied to the container image. The command that you use to build the image is Docker image build dash T to tag once the image is built. Let me call it as nginx v1, nginx colon v1. Okay, dash space dot, meaning I'm saying all the files that are needed for this image to be built in the current directory. So it is executing those set of instructions. And finally, it will come up with the image or it will build an image out of those uh, set of instructions that we have described in the Docker file. You can think of uh, Docker file is like a shell script. In shell script, we write the series of commands that will be executed by the shell one after one is what Docker also doing. Docker image build is reading the instructions from the Docker file. So it took a while to pull the packages that are needed for the NGINX. Now it is ready. When I do a Docker image LS, I see a new image built, NGINX v1. Using that image, I can create the containers. Let's do that. Docker container run. Let's call it as web02 dash dit and then the name of the image that we want to use that we just built. So using the custom image that we just built, we are creating a container. I should be saying dash dash name. Now when I do a Docker container LS, I have the container Web02 running. Let me access that. So let me identify the IP address Docker container LS. I would do Docker container inspect and the name of the container. And this is the IP address. Let me do a curl. There you go. This is the web page we wanted the NGNX web server to be serving us when it is created. So I just quickly demonstrated how to build a Docker image using a Docker file. There are a couple of options that you have. One, the simplest option is pull the image from the Docker Hub or get the image from the Docker Hub, or you can build your own image. So now we have the meaning of what Docker file is. 
a Docker file contains what? All of your application specific uh, dependencies. The Docker image is the outcome of a Docker file. And Docker container is a run instance of a container image or Docker image. So Docker file contains your application or project code using which you can build the Docker images or we also can pull the image from the Docker hub or we can also push images to Docker hub. That is also possible. So I have an account with the Docker hub. As you can see, I have logged in with the login ID of eyes on cloud. If I go to repositories. There are a couple of repositories. Now let me push my image into a Docker hub and let me quickly demonstrate how that can be done. The very first thing is let's take a look at the image that we have. Which is NGNX V1. Before even you think of pushing, you must have to tag an image. Docker image tag. Which image? We need to pick up which image are we planning to tag? And then what is your Docker Hub login ID? In my case, it is eyes on cloud. Slash. What is the name that you want to have when you push that image? I'll have the same name. And then before even you push, you need to log in to your Docker Hub account. Docker login. The username. And the password. The login is successful. Now I can say Docker image ls to confirm it has been correctly tagged. Yeah.
Hey guys, I'm sorry. Uh, there was some network issue. Am I audible? Just a message confirmation will do. Yes. No, thank you. OK, so. I was telling you that uh, there is an image. That we want to push to the Docker Hub account. I'm just resharing my screen. I'm sorry for that. As you can see, I ran the command Docker image push, the tag that I had for that image. So the image is getting pushed. Let's go ahead to the let's go ahead and verify if the image is pushed. I'll just try to refresh my Docker Hub account web page. As you can see, the NGNX image is being pushed and we had given the version as v1 so that confirms that about few seconds ago we pushed one image to the docker hub it's not only pulling an image we also can push an image you can have multiple repositories but only one of the repository can be public sorry private okay otherwise by default the repository is going to be the uh, public if you go to settings as you can see make a private it says using none of one private repository so you can have one private repository for the free uh, docker hub account otherwise the repositories are public meaning anyone can pull an image from your repository so we learned how to even push the image to the docker hub the advantage of pushing an image to the Docker Hub like a registry is for the different environments we can pull those images. If you think you know Docker Hub is a open source registry and you don't want to push your images of your organization into that, mostly organization will set up the private uh, registry. Instead, you can push your images to the private registry so that it is centrally available for different environments such as staging production. So Docker has two editions, the community edition of a Docker software, the enterprise edition of a Docker software. The community edition is ideal for individuals who are like a developers and a small teams who are looking to be get started with Docker and they just want to experiment how a containerized based application work. The enterprise edition is designed for those enterprise development and IT teams who want to build, ship, and run their business critical applications in production. It's just not the edition which is making the difference. Behind the edition, the enterprise edition provides you the support, also provides the images from the Docker trusted registry. If you have the community edition, there is no enterprise level of support available. Of course, you don't have to pay, but what if something breaks? It is only the community which can suggest you or guide you, which may work, which may not work. And you don't get the access to the stable release of the Docker. Instead, it is the trial and error version of the Docker. So you want to go with enterprise edition for production grade deployments, mostly for training, learning, for getting started with purposes. Community edition works very well. So let's understand how was the Docker designed. 
behind the docker there are many different linux kernel features such as six the kernel capabilities net link net filter app armor and many more linux kernel features uh, functionality to the docker Docker was earlier using systemd and span, LXC and libbird as the library. Now Docker is settled with lib container as the library, meaning whenever you run the Docker command, it is the lib container which talks to the Linux kernel features to get you the container created. The namespace is responsible for providing the isolation between the containers. The C group responsible for providing the resources for your application. The capabilities help control what base system kernel capabilities to be made available to the container. The SLNX Netlink Netfilter App Armor provides the security between the containers. So each of this uh, Linux kernel feature offers you a different uh, capability. So there are, few, uh, there are few of the drawbacks of Docker. If you want to manage a large number of uh, containers, which is challenging, especially if you have cluster of those Docker engines, uh, it is not easy for you to jump between different Docker engines and then manage those containers. What I mean is, Assume you have one Docker engine on which you have tens and hundreds and thousands of containers running. Some point of time, the underlying resources such as memory, CPU and storage may get exhausted. But then you think of having a second server on which you want to install the Docker engine and have the containers uh, running. But you would have to manage those two Docker engines separately. If you want to cluster them, or you want to virtually make them act as one single server, you need to go with a cluster management tool for Docker, such as Docker Swarm, the Kubernetes, Rancher, and OpenShift. There are more options available for you to manage a cluster of those Docker engines. Even in virtualization, when you have multiple hypervisors to manage, there are software appliances available we generally call it as a virtual machine managers. They help you manage multiple hypervisors. So that's your first section. And in this, uh, with this, I want to explain you uh, how do we install and configure the Docker. So hope I gave you the fundamentals of what Docker is and how to work with a Docker. I also explained you the comparison, um, what you need to know when you are planning to choose between the virtualization and the containerization. This may help you. I will put it in a chat message if you need it for your reference. So let me bring you the next lecture and following which we will have the lab exercise.